Good afternoon, everyone. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Chris Hallett, and I'm a member of faculty here at Berkeley with a joint appointment in the Department of Classics and the Department of History of Art. And it falls to me uh, to welcome all of you here uh, this afternoon to introduce this week's Say the Lecture. But before I do so, uh, I have an announcement to make. Today's lecture is actually the fifth in the series, so next week is the final one in the sequence. And uh, it's going to be held in a different place. It's downstairs um, in Dwinell, room 142. Now this is actually on all of the, uh, uh, all of the posters, and it's online, it's all, of the, all of the advertisements carry this information, but we figured you probably need to actually be told this in person uh, for it to register. <clears throat> so, unlike many of my colleagues in the classics department, I had not meet, previously met Jack Davis before he arrived in Berkeley uh, this semester to serve as, say, the professor. I knew him and his work by reputation only. And from reading the title of his, say, the series, A Bronze Age Greek State in Formation, I could never have predicted the kind of engagement with the history of the field of archaeology uh, as it has been practiced over the last century or so that we've been treated to in the four lectures that we've heard so far. For me, this has been a surprise and a welcome one. And as part of my introduction, I want to underline two, uh, I think, striking things that have emerged from Professor Davis's presentation. The first concerns uh, changing ideas about the publication of archaeological results or findings. In the last lecture, Professor Davis mentioned a conversation he had uh, many years ago with John Caskey about what was appropriate to be included in a final excavation report. And Caskey reportedly declared that there was certainly no room for speculation in such a report and that it should contain just the facts. This reminded me of some of my own experiences as a graduate student, and not just in the field of archaeology, uh, but in ancient history and classics more generally. In the late 1970s, when I was an undergraduate back in England, um, it was widely held that a book written as a textbook, or even actually um, a newspaper article or a, uh, something produced for a popular audience, ought ideally to present a consensus view of the topic. There seemed to exist at that time a tacit agreement among specialists that it did not do to dwell too much on the frailties and inadequacies of the surviving evidence. After all, that might prompt the unwelcome question, is your subject really based on such flimsy foundations? <laughs> the feeling was that one should leave out, if at all possible, the noisy disputes among scholars, the claims, counterclaims, and the often messy controversies. Those can only make us all look bad. <laughs> the idea seemed to be that this was the dirty laundry of scholarship, uh, which should be aired in public as little as possible. In my view, it's, it's an important insight in the work of Professor Davis that now, in the opening decades of the 21st century, a traditional kind of consensus representation of the field can no longer really hold the attention of beginning students and intelligent modern readers, audiences. Much of the thrill of archaeology, its intellectual excitement, lies not just in the finds themselves, but in the whole process of discovery. The organization and rationale of the expedition, the difficulties of excavating in remote and exotic places, the often competing visions of a project's goals, the strong personalities, the rivals between, rivalries between them, the disappointments and false starts, the painstaking work and the inevitable battle over the final interpretation of the finds. It's not just the results, uh, the facts, if they are facts, that modern students and the general public want to hear about. It is everything that goes into those findings or conclusions that really captures the imagination of contemporary audiences. Though these things are perhaps particularly obvious in the field of archaeology, there's a sense, of course, in which all scholarship is really like this. And not only archaeologists can learn from this insight. There is an approach to the writing of ancient history 
uh, one notably pioneered in England by Mary Beard, among others, that also highlights the process by which scholars work and by which rival theories and, and approaches are continually contested and challenged. In such cases, by making the thinking and speculations of the leading experts explicit, the subject is frequently enriched, perhaps especially as far as popular audiences are concerned. In fact, to leave all this out would, in a way, simply impoverish our accounts of the great advances that have been made in our understanding of ancient history over the last century or so. The second point concerns the finality of final excavation reports. Um, for those of you who heard last week's lecture, I will uh, speculate that it may have come as a bit of a surprise to learn that after the final publication of Carl Blagan's excavations at Pylos, Jack Davis and his team discovered a whole series of finds of painted plaster and other materials that had not been included in that publication. There were extensive excavation notes relating to these finds, apparently, but they had not been included, perhaps because they were too fragmentary or perhaps for some other reason. I must confess, I myself had not expected to hear this, but hearing Professor Davis's account did not come as a complete surprise to me. For since uh, 2005, I've been serving on the board of, a, of an organization, um, the White Levy Archaeological Publications Program, that was set up to specifically fund the publication of old, unpublished excavations. And in the more than 15 years I've been involved with the organization, we've received literally hundreds of applications to publish the results of old, closed, finished excavations. Finds and materials that somehow did not get written up or included in the field reports that were published at the time. The White Levy program gives out about a million dollars annually in support of uh, these publication projects, but we can only support about a dozen projects a year, whereas we regularly get applications for about four or five times that number. This all lends support to Professor Davis's urgent message at the end of last week's uh, lecture that we need to work harder to provide proper long-term institutional support for our archaeological research projects, to produce physical archives such as the impressive one that he showed us um, at the University of Cincinnati, I think, uh, to create curated digital archives and to continue to work with the finds of old, uh, reportedly completed excavations. The results of such excavations should be published and maintained in such a way that the data can be studied and restudied so that new interpretations in the light of new evidence or new questions can be repeatedly attempted. I could not agree more with Professor Davis's uh, conclusions about this, and I salute him for attempting to raise the profile of these concerns and to bring them to the attention of a much wider audience by incorporating these, uh, these issues, these, these questions and, and arguments into his Say the Lectures. This afternoon's lecture is titled Science and the Mortuary Landscape. Please join me in welcoming Professor Jack Davis. Thank you very much, Chris for the flattering introduction, another one. I don't, I don't know how you guys keep this up week after week. <laughs> Actually, the introductions are so much better than my presentations. <laughs> I could <laughs> just splice them all together. <laughs> Maybe I could submit them for a raise someplace. <laughs> back, at, back at home, huh? <laughs> uh, this is going to be a little different uh, this evening. Uh, for one thing, I'm not going to show any slides for a while, so bear with me. Uh, I will we'll then start showing some slides and we'll turn the lights down. Okay, so let me begin. In 1977, immediately after finishing my PhD, I was hired into a tenure-track job, something I never thought would happen. I had no teaching experience. Few people did back then. The object of graduate school seemed to be to shape us into blisteringly sharp researchers. And the only advice I got about teaching was from a classical art historian who said, as I was leaving uh, to assume my new position, he said, one per minute, 50 per class. 
that slides that is. <laughs> so on arriving at the University of Illinois at Chicago, or as it was called, Chicago Circle back then, in a city that was much more uh, unfamiliar to me, much more foreign than was Athens, I was baffled to find that I'd been hired to teach archaeological science in addition to Latin, topography, and monuments of Athens and ancient literature and translation. Now what had happened is my new department had received a grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities in order to explore the creation of an interdisciplinary program that was supposed to bridge the natural, natural and physical sciences, the humanities, and the social sciences, and three model courses had been scheduled already. But at that point, the PI of the grant took a sabbatical. So I found myself co-teaching classes in ancient structural engineering with two structural engineers, two real structural engineers, ancient ceramic technology with an art potter and a petrographer, and ancient metallurgy with a mechanical engineer who held patents for hip replacements. <laughs> now, why anyone thought at, I might, at the age of 27, be qualified to teach these courses remains a mystery to me today. Other than that, as a graduate student, I'd begun several collaborations with people uh, who, um, as we probably still call them, uh, non-classicists, an ambivalent term that in the eyes of some of my professors at least woke suspicions about, about me and my intent. I had also been tarred by the brush of anthropology in my early 20s <laughs> against the advice of my thesis advisor and my graduate advisor who warned us graduate students about problems in anthropology. And the best circumstances, we were advised that anthropological uh, archaeology was rather bogus, but that lately any possible legitimacy that it had had been compromised by what was being called the new archaeology. But even as a graduate student, bits of contraband came my way from anthropology, including a paper titled Archaeology with a Capital S by Kent Flannery who's still teaching at the University of Michigan. And when I pulled the book in which it was published off our library shelf last year in preparation for my lecture this evening, I found the book uh, is living proof that a divide between classical archaeology and anthropology lives on. It had never been checked out. Uh, <laughs> not, e not even for the seminar in archaeological theory for which it was purchased 20 years ago. Now, I loved the paper in 1973 when I first read it. Uh, if you don't know it, the capital S in the title refers to science with a capital S, not the natural or physical sciences, uh, although methods drawing on expertise from those disciplines had already become an important part of anthropological archaeology. What Kent Flannery cared about was the creation of archaeology as a science concerned with process, one operating within a Hempelian hypothetical deductive framework. Flannery humorously in this paper defined two contesting approaches, what he called a law and order approach, which he criticizes for confusing statistical correlations with causation, and sometimes resulting in what he also called Mickey Mouse generalizations or laws, and also a serotan approach, which was named for the then popular laxative, which many of us will remember. Uh, which is essentially the systems anal analysis of Ludwig van Bertenlaufe, uh, an approach that recognizes that uh, everything isn't all that simple and provides a more subtle avenue to think about the explanation of causation. Now, why this was the, while this was the most important aspect of science for American anthropological archaeologists, I soon discovered that for American classical archaeologists, especially prehistorians, their obsession was with natural and physical sciences, not philosophy of science. Uh, Bill McDonald, whom I've mentioned in several lectures already, was a pioneer of the Mediterranean's version of the new archaeology. But that was an archaeology that was hardly processual or concerned with laws of human behavior. Bill was inspired by the large interdisciplinary expeditions mounted by Bob Adams and Bob Braidwood in the Near East and Scotty McNeish and Bill Sanders in the valley of Teotihuacan, anthropologists of an older generation than Louis Binford, 
and foils against whom Binford and Flannery had created their visions of anthropological archaeology. MacDonald described the philosophy of his project as follows. There is no argument, at least among scholars like Adams and Braidwood, about the importance of obtaining all relevant information about the natural environment, as well as the cultural features of the target region. The real rub is how to collect the information, digest it, and present it in an integrated form. For him, the answer was to coordinate, or at least try to coordinate, a large team of specialists in the field, and subsequently uh, shepherd them in publication in the hope that the resulting product would be inter and not merely multidisciplinary. The purpose of my lecture today is to describe to you our own approach to anthropological science at PILOS, and in particular, I want to tell you what we've learned from collaborative analysis of human skeletal material from graves excavated by Blagan's team. In the course of reorganizing those storerooms of the museum that I talked about last week, we were able to locate most of the human remains that Blagan had found in Mycenaean graves. We learned then that this material had been previously studied in only a very cursory way by J. Lawrence Angel, curator at the Smithsonian Institution and a giant in his day. Sharon Stocker and I have now been able definitively to examine human remains and artifacts from three Tholos tombs and seven chamber tombs in collaboration with physical anthropologist Lynn Shepartz of the University of Witwatersrand in Johannesburg and prehistorian Joanne Murphy of the University of North Carolina, Greensboro. And in all, we have a total of 179 dead individuals. In studying the mortuary sphere, our approach has been to avoid problems of the past insofar as possible. In Greece, at least, both processual archaeology and archaeological science have lingering legacies from the 1970s, some of which are, I think, far from positive. One inheritance of processual archaeology has been an insistence that archaeological projects be of limited duration with very focused research agenda. However, last week, I tried to address the benefits that accrue from a longer-term commitment to place. As for archaeological science, it's continued to be the case that very few American natural or physical scientists working in classical archaeology uh, are trained in anthropology or in archaeology. In the U.S., researchers are often drawn from the existing staff in home institutions, a practice that is warmly encouraged by our administrators, who are very eager to see classics integrated with other disciplines. But one of the biggest problems come when scientists conduct their investigations without very well-conceived research designs. And some recent studies of human remains have fallen into this trap. We have, for example, seen far-reaching claims with major implications for Greek prehistory based on scientific results that are difficult for me to accept on archaeological grounds. And one of the more problematic examples that I'll give you is entitled Mycenaean Political Domination of Knossos Following the Late Minoan 1b Destructions on Crete, Negative Evidence from Strontium Isotope Racial Analysis, a study published in the Journal of Archaeological Science, JAS. The author proposes to test an hypothesis that a Mycenaean invasion of Crete which probably most of us learned about in graduate school, if we learned anything about Greek prehistory, that this invasion was responsible for bringing the Minoan palace period to an end. The author's scientific techniques involved measuring the ratio of two isotopes of strontium, which demonstrably really can reflect differences in bedrock geology of relevant areas. Since particular characteristics of local geology are transferred into local food chains and from there lodge in the human skeleton through consumed food and water. That local signature 
then remains frozen in childhood dental enamel. There thus exists the potential for distinguishing between individuals born and raised in a particular location and immigrants from elsewhere. The idea that it was a mainland invasion that was responsible for cultural changes on Crete in the 15th century BC is, as I said, by now old hat, and by many has been accepted as the explanation for the replacement of the Minoans Linear A script by Greek Linear B as the language of administration at Knossos. An important part of the argument, as originally formulated largely by British scholars, was that the so-called warrior graves in the Knossos area hold the remains of mainlanders, that is, Mycenaeans. Today, however, there is a great deal of skepticism, particularly among prehistorians working on Crete, that a mainland invasion was responsible for destruction of the Cretan palaces or for the major upheavals in material culture that occurred in the 15th century. Samples of human remains before and after the major destructions on Crete were included in the Journal of Archaeological Science study, including several from these warrior graves at Knossos that are dated in the words of the author to the period immediately following the destructions. These samples were then compared to the isotopic signature of the Knossos and Mycenae areas. The author's conclusion was that if the individuals buried in the warrior graves had been invaders from the Argolid, their isotopic signatures would have matched those of the geology of Mycenae. But instead, she found no significant differences between individuals who died at Knossos prior to and after the destructions. What, however, if the individuals buried in these graves were descendants, even by a single generation, of mainland invaders rather than the first wave of invaders themselves. And this is far from certain. The tombs sampled contained multiple burials, and the excavator Mervyn Popham suggests a date as late as the end of, well, this late might know in 3A1, don't worry about that, <laughs> for the pottery deposited with these warriors and a date range of 1417 to 1365 for the burials, and the precision here comes from a scarab of Amenophis III, which was found in the tomb. So we're, we're possibly here considerably later than the 15th century BC, which was the target date for the invasion. Mistaking conclusions can obviously lead scholarship astray. Other times, there can be glaring social consequences too. And I think these are nowhere more uh, obvious than in the case of genetic studies concerning the Minoan civilization of Crete. The Minoans, of course, have long been a problem for the Greek state. Modern scholarship has concluded definitively that the Minoan language was not Greek, not even Indo-European. So how then to incorporate the Minoans into a national project that has emphasized homogeneity and continuity? Current genetic studies seem to be offering a solution to the conundrum, allowing teams of Greek and generally non-Greek scientists to support, however, a state ideology of which non-Greek collaborators must be largely unaware. This has been possible, it seems, because studies have been published in prestigious venues for science, such as nature, but with minimal scrutiny from qualified referees outside the genetics community. I'll give you an example. In 2017, in Nature Letter, there was an article published called Genetic Origins of the Minoans and Mycenaeans, which seems to me to have been rushed into print after analysis of samples had been supplied by various archaeologists. A half dozen are listed among the 34 authors. In such a jumble of contributors, it's difficult to know who should take credit or perhaps blame for the results. The paper asserts, here we show that Minoans and Mycenaeans were genetically similar, having at least three quarters of their ancestry from the first Neolithic farmers of Western Anatolia and the Aegean. 
and most of the remainder from ancient populations related to those of the Caucasus and Iran. Mycenaeans, however, unlike Minoans, according to their results, supposedly have additional genetic makeup, which is related to pre-Neolithic populations of Western Europe and the Caucasus. And they further conclude that modern Greeks are related to Mycenaeans, a conclusion that certainly would have warmed the heart of Christos Tsundas, whom I mentioned a couple of lectures ago, and was quickly celebrated by the neo-Nazi party of Greece, in whose platform continuity and racial purity remains fundamental. And we're also relieved to find that they say, they report that there's no measurable Levantine or African influence in either the Minoans or the Mycenaeans. And I remember very well, uh, not so many years ago, there was a riot in the capital of the island of Crete because an archeologist suggested that the Minoans came from the Levant. And the titles in the morning newspapers the next day were prominent archeologists says the Minoans were Jews. And there were throngs of people in the public square protesting this conclusion. Now, anyway, these conclusions all sound pretty good until you look at the sample. There's a total of only 19 individuals, 10 of them Minoans, supposedly, chosen from Bronze Age context prior to the supposal, supposed arrival of mainlanders on Crete, and just four Mycenaeans from contexts that cover the entirety of the late Bronze Age. Two modern Cretans were thrown into the soup for good measure, although how they were chosen is not clear nor specified. After millennia of population mixing and exchanges, it remains in any case, I think, to be seen just how one might recognize a genetically pure modern Cretan. Even in supposed reservoirs of Cretanness, such as the uplands in eastern Crete in the Lasithi Plain, which we know the entire population was replaced by the Venetians with colonists from elsewhere. The authors are quick to note, and I quote again here, that relative ancestral contributions do not determine the relative roles in the rise of civilization of different ancestral populations. But I ask, was this ever in doubt? But is it even possible to speak of Minoans or Mycenaeans as single ethnic groups when we're using these terms to speak of cultures, not genetic groups? <coughs> of course, there are interesting practical applications of DNA analysis in regard to the programs of mortuary studies. We're obviously interested in genetic relationships among individuals buried in a tomb, as well as between tombs and tomb groups. Although it's generally assumed that members of the same family or lineage were buried in a tomb, there still exists very little hard data to support that conclusion. For early Mycenaean pylos, the acquisition of genetic information is particularly relevant. There we have multiple tholos or beehive tombs, all of which are being used at the same time for lavish displays of burial. Were these monuments erected in order to hold remains of different lineages, each in competition with the others? DNA seems to have the potential to evaluate that model. Our own program of DNA analysis is still underway. But I can tell you already a great deal about mort the mortuary landscape of early Mycenaean pylos and the nature of the people buried in early Mycenaean tombs based on our analyses of material from Blagan's excavation. And here we will start some slides. Uh, we have the lights out. Thank you, Emma. First, I turn to the tombs themselves, and particularly to the three monumental burials excavated by Blagan on the Anglianos Ridge, among the earliest in the Peloponnese and earlier than any in the Argolid. The so-called Grave Circle and Tholos III southwest of the Acropolis on which the Palace of Nestor would later be built, and Tholos IV to the northeast. Now, last week at the end of my lecture, I pointed you toward the gate through the fortifications of the early Mycenaean citadel and Tholos IV. So I show you that slide again. I'll return to that point in a moment, since that gate seems to have been the starting point for a road leading to what we now must understand, I think, to be the major elite cemetery of, early Mycenaean, of the early Mycenaean town. 
encompassing not only Tholos IV, but also the grave of the Griffin warrior and some various surprising finds that are being investigated even as I speak tonight. Well, they will be in a few hours um, after eight o'clock tonight again. But there is a second exit. There is a second exit from the town and the Acropolis. Broad stairs led down the slope and a road continued toward the sea. As in classical Greek times, roads of this sort provided locations for elite burials next to them. Along this road, only a couple hundred meters from the Acropolis was a monumental grave that Blagan called the Grave Circle. Now we have no clear idea of its original appearance since only a single course of stones arranged in a circle was found. The monument itself has today been long since destroyed by local farmers in the course of plowing their fields. Some burials were deposited in small, uh, what we call pithoi, a kind of storage jar, or in decorated jars. I show you a couple examples here. Others were simply set in pits. Lord William Taylor, who excavated at Mycenae, but was also a collaborator of Blagan at Pylos, excavated the grave circle on behalf of Blagan. He was convinced that he'd found the remains of a dismantled Tholos tomb. But Blagan wanted it to be something like the grave circles of Mycenae, and thus it was. Whatever the case, the grave circle was a place for the deposition of elite burials at the start of the early Mycenaean period. The quality of the finds associated with the burials is extraordinary. Many imported from Crete, such as a cauldron, the handles of which are tiny hands. What a shame that the ancient Greek word for handle isn't little hand, <laughs> as it is in common modern Greek. Were the Minoans ahead of the curve? <laughs> I don't know. Several of the jars used for burials were even made on Crete specifically at Knossos. What is even more fascinating is that these jars are of types often also employed at Knossos for burial, suggesting that those are responsible for the burials at Pylos understood how they were to be used. There are long swords that seem to betray the warlike character of some of the burials, and also what I believe are parts of ceremonial armor in the upper left side. Specifically, lappets made of silver that presumably had been attached to a leather skirt, as in the later Mycenaean Tarzan wall painting from the Palace of Nestor, which I show you on the lower right. Although Blagan thought that these belonged to a crown and oriented them in the other direction. Most of the pottery that can be associated with the burials dates to the 15th century. That is contemporary with the grave of the Griffin warrior. Now farther from the Acropolis, along the same road to the sea, Mrs. Blagan excavated another Tholos tomb. Number three in Blagan's system. In 1939. I show you more or less where it is toward the sea. It's about a kilometer away from the Acropolis and well outside the early Mycenaean settlement, but it too was used for elite burials in the 15th century BC. But now I want to return to the other side of the Acropolis and to the road leading inland through that gateway. Tholos IV, see located here amidst the olive trees, is on the other side of the Acropolis and until recently has been considered to be younger than the grave circle. In light of recent research, however, published by Stocker and myself, Tholos IV now seems to be at least as early in construction and use as the grave circle. It may, in fact, be the earliest known Tholos tomb on the Greek mainland. Here it is, the roof has been reconstructed, the late 1950s. The evidence for its date 
consists of three substantially complete pots that must have been the first ceramic vessels deposited in the tomb with burials, including another one of those Cretan jars that's likely to have served as a burial container, and also a pouring vessel, a ewer. Both should be dated to the 17th century BC, that is a couple hundred years here before the burial of the Griffin warrior, and both were found uh, smashed and dragged into the dromos, or the road leading into the tomb, when it has been reopened to receive later burials in Mycenaean times. The similarity between the gold jewelry in Tholos IV and that from Grave Circle B at Mycenae, at Peristeria, and at Kakovatos in Elis, suggests that it as the Grave Circle was used for burials in the 15th century BC, although it, like the Grave of the Griffin Warrior, contained no pottery within the chamber. Pointing, it seems, to the great wealth at Pelos at this time. Although it had been looted in antiquity, indications of its wealth remained, such as this marvelous gold seal, which has become iconic for the area, and uh, the uh, gold ring, which you see below, which shows a Minoan cultic scene. Now, both the grave circle and Tholos IV are within shooting distance of the Acropolis of Pelos, or I guess I should say arrow distance within the, the Acropolis. Uh, as is the grave of the Griffin Warrior, which is only about 75 meters, uh, look at the red arrow here, only about 75 meters away from Tholos IV. The grave of the Griffin Warrior was, of course, uh, an enormous surprise when we found it in 2015. The location uh, where we excavated to find it was our Plan B because we were not able to complete expropriation in the courts of the neighboring field where we really wanted to dig, the brown-colored uh, field here. It's not really brown. We colorized it for you. Uh, this is where we really wanted to work, and we had begun legal proceedings a decade before, in 2005, thinking that would be plenty of time to get through the courts and have the field be ready to go when we were granted a permit to excavate. There were very few surface indications of what lay beneath, but within a day or so, the start of the dig, the walls of the grave, that's what it looked like on the surface when we started, the walls of the grave began to emerge. Uh, I honestly thought that at best this would be a looted grave, but uh, Two of our field uh, team, uh, we were at the bank cashing money, which is something that directors of projects spend a lot of time doing. And I got a text message, come back to the site right now, we hit bronze. So we drove from the bank to the grave and we excavated for another five months on special permission from the Greek Archaeological Service who felt it was unsafe to leave the excavation unfinished. And during that period, we found thousands of artifacts from above and around a single male body that had been placed in the tomb. Give you some idea of their distribution. The existence of three monumental tombs and the incredible riches of the Griffin Warrior so near the site of the later palace, and here are some of those finds, just a sample, um, is, marks a truly extraordinary investment in wealth in the mortuary arena at the very time that the first monumental buildings were built on the Acropolis, something I talked about last week, while also making it difficult to understand for us why the Griffin warrior was buried by himself. Now, uh, we have a necklace uh, which we have published, and uh, these sheets that we handed out, you can see the, the publications, the discussions of that wonderful necklace uh, we just published, of one of the gold rings, a bull, my know and bull leaping scene, the lower left, that's also published. The find on the right is not published. It's the most amazing uh, sword, bronze long sword, 
with a gold handle. But what's really striking about it is that the gold handle is not made from a single sheet of gold. It's made from little teeny staples, literally thousands of teeny staples, about the, half the size of an American staple, that are set into some kind of organic residue that's been placed over, we're not sure quite yet, a wooden or an ivory core. And these have all been set in a technique of kind of gold embroidery, but after they set them all in, they polished it so that you couldn't see the seams between the staples in order to hide the artistry. And then what's more, they engraved a design on top of it. And we uh, are still kind of unraveling, deciphering that design, but it seems to be, it seems to be a lion taking down a deer. Uh, we'll have more to say about that in the future. It's still very much under conservation, a spectacular find. And of course, at PLS, we also have contemporary wealthy chamber tombs that contain multiple burials near the Acropolis, especially along the road leading to the sea. And I, I show you uh, Lord William Taylor here and his excavators uh, in the late 1950s, having uh, completed one, excavations of one of those tombs and a ground plan to show you what one would look like. Now, the extraordinary uh, character of the Tholos tombs in particular and the exceptional treatment of the individuals who are buried in them is even more impressive when one considers what a small percentage of the population that lived on the Anglianos Ridge was buried in either a Tholos or a chamber tomb. And now we turn once again to the results of the Pylos Regional Archaeological Project, which I've mentioned several times already. Uh, as a first stage in determining the extent of the settlement around the Acropolis, our intensive survey teams walked the entire ridge, enabling us to define the areas with the highest densities of artifacts. And from this phase of our research in the, the vicinity of the palace stands out quite clearly as a hotspot of density. Our second stage was collection of about 36,000 pot shirts from about 470 20 by 20 meter grid squares in areas where survey observed the highest densities of artifacts. And analysis of those collections permitted us to estimate the size of the settlement around the Acropolis and to conclude that by the early Mycenaean period, the settlement had, uh, was about half the size of the later settlement at the time of the destruction of the Palace of Nestor in the 13th century BC. A settlement of such size, we should imagine, housed a population of more than a thousand individuals. And if we consider the likely lifetime, the average lifetime of an individual, the length of a generation in the Mycenaean period, thousand living individuals would have contributed thousands of burials to the mortuary community of the settlement over the two centuries that constitute the early Mycenaean period. Whereas our sample from all the graves excavated by Blagan, as I said, consists of only 179 individuals. Now, obviously we have more that are coming out from excavations now. But the positive and negative evidence on the whole, I think points to the existence of three levels in the social hierarchy in early Mycenaean times. The highest ranked elite burials in Tholoi, others in chamber tombs, but non-elites leaving no trace in the archaeological record at all. I think it's hard to escape the conclusion that most individuals did not receive formal burial, at least no formal burial that we can recognize today. Certainly those buried in Tholos tombs stand out as special, privileged, when it comes to consideration of their mortal remains. And our strategy with dealing with human skeletal material has been since the beginning to maintain this partnership that I mentioned with a physical anthropologist rather than with a skeletal biologist or osteologist. It has been Lynn Shepard's, oops, ah, here we go, that's the data I just mentioned. It's been Lynn Shepard's, here's what she looks like, of Vit Vatersrand who has been responsible for ensuring the focus of our research remains fixated on cultural anthropological questions. And Joanne Murphy of Greensboro 
has been responsible for republication of the finds from graves and their context. One fundamental uh, conclusion of Lin's analyses has been that uh, proportional representation of different age cohorts is the same for chamber tombs and tholoi. The largest cohort being young adults, is people between 19 and 30 years of age. Nor do proportions of males and females differ from tomb type. The overall equal distribution of males and females seems to come down in support of the hypothesis that these are family tombs. But it doesn't rule out factions, which may have had, in any case, a basis in kingship. There is no evidence for preferential burial of males, as J. Lawrence Angel once claimed. A major focus of our research has been on paleo diet. What did these people eat? We wondered if social position, gender, or even both factors explained the differences in dental health that we were starting to detect. Our large sample has allowed us to say meaningful things we think about the composition of the Mycenaean diet, and perhaps more importantly, to determine that access to protein differed according to social position and gender. I'm getting behind myself here. Yeah, um, Samples from teeth or bones were collected from 67 individuals and the stable isotopes of carbon and nitrogen preserved in them studied. Carbon isotopes can be used to distinguish between three major dietary categories, marine resources, most leafy plants, and grasses. Nitrogen isotopes can be used to distinguish between terrestrial and marine protein consumption. The results of these analyses point to minimal consumption of marine resources in all groups, independent of tomb type. But they did reveal considerable variability in meat consumption that is correlated with tomb type. In fact, individuals buried in Tholos tombs exhibited some of the highest values of all. Females from Tholos tombs consumed the least, uh, from chamber tombs, excuse me, consumed the least animal protein. In comparing chamber tombs and tholos tombs, higher amounts of animal protein were consumed by individuals buried in the latter, and their dental health was superior. The Mycenaean social system resulted in clearly significantly poorer dental health for women at Pylos than for men. The differences occur in both the Tholos and chamber tombs. Males from Tholos tombs with the fewest uh, caries and tooth losses. Stable isotope analyses show the same patterns, with Tholos tomb males exhibiting the highest level of animal protein in their diet. What is important to note here is that, as at Mycenae, where the same differences are detectable between burials in the shaft graves and chamber tombs, the results from analyses of individuals buried in our Tholos tombs point to differential life experiences from those interred in chamber tombs. These results are particularly interesting in that they hint that already in the early Mycenaean period, the health of individuals was being differentiated according to status. What, though, explains the differences in access to protein between men and women and the poor dental health of women? Now, one potential explanation for the latter is that women typically spend more time preparing meals and tend to snack and taste while doing so. Frequent snacking has been linked in cultural anthropological studies to higher rates of tooth decay. Another fact that we've considered, though, is that men may have had more access to protein because of their more frequent participation in the feasts that we know were a tactic of the Mycenaean king, or Wanax as he was called, for promoting uh, solidarity, and for which, as uh, we saw in my last lecture, we have evidence already in early Mycenaean pylos. 
Variable access to feasts could also explain why our results for linear enamel hyper, uh, hypoplasia do not follow the pattern seen for dental caries and tooth loss. Uh, hypoplasias are indicative of relatively acute childhood stresses experienced by an entire population. In contrast, dental caries and tooth losses reflect the adult situation, uh, in this case for those resident at Pilos. Differential adult access to politically important feasts where meat was consumed could explain, we think, why dental caries and tooth losses differ significantly by gender and status, while the prevalence of hypoplasia does not. But now we can add yet another mechanism that would have contributed to superior elite health more generally. That is, access to more food and to a more diverse range of food as the product from agricultural benefices that two weeks ago I suggested were already operating in the early Mycenaean period for the advantage of an emergent elite. My final lecture next week will consider some of the things that one of these elite, whom you see here on the screen, the Griffin warrior himself, has to tell us about power and ideology in early Mycenaean Pylos. Thank you very much.